Chapter 6 Becca didn't have to threaten Jennifer even once the following morning, and to reward her, they had a couple of the boxed lunches Bree made for the guests after they'd finished cleaning up the breakfast dishes. They took their lunches out to the gazebo, where they ran into Hunter. Becca decided to sit back and watch as Jennifer flirted with him. If he was one to be easily swayed by the pretty blonde, then he wasn't the right man for her anyway. Hunter looked up apprehensively as Jennifer sat beside him. What are you typing? she asked, trying to see his screen. Hunter looked at Becca, a frightened look on his face. A murder mystery. Oh. Are you a writer? I've always wanted to meet a writer. Would you put me in a book? Jennifer's eyes were wide, and she gave him one of the vapid looks she gave every man she was coming on to. I have too many characters already. I guess I could kill you off if you wanted. He didn't look at Becca as he said it, because he knew he'd start laughing. Kill me off? Are you kidding? Jennifer folded her arms across her chest. You wouldn't really kill me off, would you? He shrugged. Usually when someone interrupts my work, that's how I get my revenge. I kill them in my next book. I'd be happy to kill you if you want to be in a book. Jennifer wrinkled her nose. Isn't there a nicer character you could make me be? She asked, running her fingers along his arm. He felt as if a spider was crawling on him, using his other hand to wipe away her touch. You don't listen to Hall and Oates by any chance, do you? The blonde shook her head. I've never heard of them. Why? He shrugged. They just have a song that I think of when I look at you. At that, Becca covered her mouth with her hand, her shoulders shaking with laughter. You bugged him enough, Jennifer. Remember he's a guest at the band B. Come and eat your lunch. She felt like she was talking to a small child, and sometimes that's just how Jennifer acted. Jennifer stood and joined her at the small table where she was eating. We'll be quiet so we don't interrupt you anymore, Hunter. Hunter nodded at her, his eyes filled with laughter. I think I've had enough of fresh air anyway. I'll go work in my room for a while. Becca watched him go, still trying to hide her grin from Jennifer. When the other girl asked who Hall and Oates were, she giggled uncontrollably, holding her sights. Hunter had more than passed the Jennifer test. Asterisk. That evening after supper, Becca left the house, heading for the hotel. She was in dire need of a soak in the hot springs, and she was going to get it. Bree had agreed to be on call for a few hours, because of the time poor Becca had to spend with Jennifer. Honestly, the time spent with Jennifer wasn't as torturous for Becca as it would have been for Bree. Jennifer had always had a healthy respect for Becca, even before she'd bloodied her nose in seventh grade. For some reason, she'd known right away that Becca wouldn't be cowed by her, and she was always at least cordial. Becca was almost to the hotel when she heard her name being called from behind her. She turned to find Hunter hurrying toward her. What are you up to? He asked. I'm going to go soak in the hot springs. It's been a long couple of days. That's what I was thinking. I've written more in the three days I've been here than I ever have in two weeks before. I'm really on a roll. She smiled. So you're rewarding yourself with a soak? Yes, I thought I would. Mind if I join you? Not at all. He held the door to the hotel so she could precede him. Stopping at the front desk, she said, This is Hunter, one of the Band B guests. We're here to use the springs. The lady at the desk nodded, handing them each a pass. You know the way, Becca. Becca nodded. Sure do. She went toward the back of the hotel and out a door to an outdoor area with wooden benches that had been built around the natural springs. She pulled her t-shirt over her head and unfastened her cut-off denim shorts. I'm so ready for this. She carefully stepped in the tub, not at all self-conscious about her body. She was very aware of his eyes on her as he stripped off his shirt and followed her in. 
He groaned as the hot water lapped at his chest. This feels so good. I know. You must get sore from sitting hunched over that keyboard so much. She reached out and gently massaged his hand. Do your hands ever get sore? He nodded. All the time. I think it's an occupational hazard. I can't believe you told Jennifer that she made you think of a Hall and Oates song today. I couldn't quit giggling. Laughing he shook his head. I shouldn't have, but I couldn't resist. She seems like the type who just needs to have her head messed with on occasion. Definitely. What are you going to tell her if she asks which song? He shrugged. No idea. He looked over at Becca, who was resting with the back of her head against the wooden bench behind them. She was really making a play for me today. Was that just for your benefit? Oh, of course not. Jennifer makes plays for every man in town between the ages of 20 and 40. Of course, if she thinks any of the Roberts women are interested, the play is much harder and stronger. She must not have realized that I'm falling for you, or she would have turned it up about ten notches. Hunter blinked at her. Falling for me? Isn't that putting it a bit strongly? We just met on Wednesday. Becca shrugged. Doesn't matter. I knew when I met you that you were the man for me. Now we just have to figure out if I'm the woman for you. He was still trying to figure out how to respond to that when the back door of the hotel opened. A couple of young men came out. Becca. When are we going dancing again? One of them asked. Becca laughed. Go find a girl you're actually interested in to dance with, Jordan. You just want to go out with me, because you can't figure out why I won't sleep with you. Jordan sighed. Why won't you sleep with me? She shook her head. Same reason I won't sleep with anyone. I'm waiting for Mr. Wright. Her eyes were on Hunter as she said the words, wishing he'd believe her. And you can't dance with me while you're waiting? Becca laughed. You go find someone else to dance with. Ask Jennifer. We took dance lessons together, and I happen to know she's a very good dancer. Jordan rolled his eyes. Like she'd go out with me. I'm just a peon who works for her parents. Buy her some tulips, and she'll do anything for you. Tulips are her favorite. Jordan finished picking up the towels that guests had strewn everywhere. Why are you trying to help me with Jennifer? You're supposed to be jealous of her. I'm not one to really get jealous. Especially when there are no feelings involved. You know that. Yeah. Maybe I'll ask Jennifer out. I've heard she's fun on a date. I'm sure she is. She swatted Hunter's arm when he started humming Man Eater. Who's your friend? Jordan asked, watching them. This is Hunter. He's a guest at the Band B for a few weeks. She wanted to say he was more, but at the moment, he wasn't. Hunter raised his hand in a wave. Good to meet you. Don't fall for Becca. She's left a long trail of broken hearts behind her, Jordan told him. Get a grip. You never had any feelings for me at all. You just wanted another conquest. Go play with Jennifer. Fine. I'll see if I can get my hands on some tulips. Oh, and order her some Frank's fudge from Wyoming. The best chocolate I've ever had. Then she'll be eating from the palm of your hand. Jordan shook his head. Maybe you should open up a business where you give advice to the lonely and desperate. No one wants to pay me for advice they've heard me give for free. Becca waited until Jordan was gone before she hoisted herself up to the edge of the springs, just letting her feet dangle in. One broken heart from the trail you left behind you? Hunter asked. Becca laughed. Jordan moved here for college and never left. We had a couple of classes together, and we went out a couple of times, but his heart wasn't in it any more than mine was. Why'd you go out with him then? She smiled. He's a good dancer, and I love to dance. Ah, I see. 
And he did. Kind of. He'd never been much of a casual dater, or any kind of dater really, so the casual thing was odd for him. He thought if you went out with someone, there was some level of commitment. Apparently, she thought differently. He'd have to keep that in mind. Asterisk. Jennifer didn't work on Saturday, so Becca was able to do her usual work instead. She cleaned the rooms quickly and efficiently, taking a fraction of the time it took her and Jennifer together. And then she went outside and started to work on the flower beds. She usually spent a few minutes every day pulling weeds, but this week had been all messed up. She was on her knees wearing her gardening gloves when her brother Spike walked up behind her, nudging her with his foot. What's this I hear about some big city guy coming in and flirting with my sister? Get a grip, Spike. I'm working here. He dropped to his knees beside her. Pulling weeds? What else? So tell me about this guy. Becca sighed. He's a writer. Lives in Denver. I took one look at him and saw stars. I'm going to run away with him and have his babies. Good enough? She was ready to say anything to get Spike off her case. She'd known everyone in town must be talking about them, but having confirmation didn't help much. You'll marry him first, right? You know Dad will have a hissy fit if it happens the other way around. Becca laughed. Of course I'll marry him first. I wouldn't want to scandalize the whole town. She crossed her eyes at her brother. Spike nudged her with his shoulder, almost causing her to fall. Behave yourself. She slammed back into her brother, trying to knock him over. Hunter walked outside and saw Becca pulling weeds with a man he'd never met. Does she always have a man around? Don't touch me, you freak. Becca said, laughing. Go away. Go climb a mountain or something. I might do just that. Are there any of Bree's muffins left? I'm hungry. Why don't you eat before you come? Or go patronize books and beans. We're not here to serve free food to wastrels. So I'm a wastrel now, am I? How rude. Spike jumped to his feet, his eyes locking onto Hunter. Becca's eyes widened as she saw the two men shaking hands. Hunter, my brother, Spike. Spike, my writer, Hunter. Hunter looked at Spike's crooked grin. I should have known. Huh? Spike asked. Your smile. It's the Robert's smile. Hunter looked at Becca. And since when am I your writer? Becca shrugged. I claimed you. So now you're mine. We'll argue about it later, if you want. Spike laughed. She's going to give you a run for your money. Just be kind to her, and I won't have to kill you. Hunter nodded at Spike. I'll do my best. He wasn't at all offended when her brother threatened him. In fact, he'd have been offended if he hadn't. Becca stood up, brushing the dirt off the front of her. Let me go see what muffins we have left. She went into the house, realizing both of the men were following her. In the kitchen, she went to the container where Brie put all the leftover muffins. So often family came by wanting them, that they'd started making more than they expected to use and storing them in Tupperware. Do these need to be warmed up? She asked Spike, already knowing his answer. Of course. Don't catch anything on fire when you nuke them. Becca stuck her tongue out at her brother before putting several muffins into a special cloth bag that Bree's mother had made to keep them from drying out and slipping them into the microwave. She put some butter on the table. Coffee or milk? Who made the coffee? Spike asked, pulling out a chair and sitting at the table right there in the kitchen. Bree did. Right before she left. It's not poison. Spike made a face. It's not as good as Emma's, but at least it's not yours. Coffee works. Hunter looked between the siblings, unsure if he was supposed to be in the kitchen. He was just a guest after all. 
sit. Becca told him. Hunter sat down taking one of the plates Becca put in the center of the table. I wasn't sure if I should. I'm not family. Sounds like Becca wants you to be, Spike told him. Becca was on her way to get the muffins from the microwave, but she didn't even break stride as she swatted her brother across the back of his head. What do you want to drink, Hunter? I'll take some milk. Hunter was enjoying watching Becca with her brother. He couldn't help but wonder if the whole family was like that. Jack and Bree certainly seemed to enjoy teasing Becca as well. Becca plopped the heated muffins onto the center of the table before going to pour two glasses of milk and a cup of coffee. She sat down and joined them in their afternoon snack. Does anyone need anything else? Spike reached into the bag and pulled out an orange muffin. I knew today was orange muffin day. I could sense it. Yeah, I was going to call you later if you didn't show up. I knew you wouldn't want to miss out. You're a good sister when you're not hitting me. Spike buttered the muffin and bit into it. You nuke a fine muffin. Becca made a face. I only hit you when you deserve it, and I can bake muffins too, you know. I know you can. If Brie has the batter all mixed up and all you have to do is shove it in the oven for as long as she tells you to. He ate another bite of the muffin and took a sip of coffee. I sure wish Emma would tell us the secret to her delicious coffee. Not in this lifetime. Becca shrugged. We'll all have to live without knowing. She swore she'd take the secret to her grave. Spike looked at Hunter. Do you have any sisters to plague your existence? Hunter shook his head. Just a brother. He's two years younger than me. Count yourself lucky. I have three sisters. Three. You'd think another boy would have been the luck of the draw, but no. Just girls. He grabbed another muffin and buttered it. What's your brother's name? Ryder. And what does Ryder do? He's an accountant. As opposite from writing as it comes. Why is an accountant the opposite of writing? Becca asked, not understanding. To be an accountant, you can't have a creative bone in your body. I make stuff up for a living, and he works with numbers all day. Are you close? Spike asked. Hunter shrugged. Semi. I mean, we don't hate each other or anything, but we don't have much in common, so we don't spend a lot of time together. Are both your parents still living? Why don't I just give you my full name, social security number? and driver's license number. That way you can run a background check, and you don't have to waste your voice. Spike grinned. Would you? That would make this so much easier. Spike. That's just rude. Becca admonished. I can't believe you actually said that. Oh, please. With you for a sister, I've learned that I can say just about anything. It's not like you've ever minced words. Spike got to his feet. Mom wants all of us at her house for dinner tomorrow night. Including Hunter. You were seen dancing in the gazebo in the middle of the night. Tongues are wagging. He grabbed another muffin as he headed for the door. Dinner's at six. Don't be late now. After Spike closed the door behind him, Becca groaned. You do not want to meet my family all at once. It's really not good for anyone, but most especially not for you. Hunter smiled. I like the family I've met so far. One or even two at a time isn't awful. When you meet six at once, there's a problem. And I'm sure that Spike will bring Amy. And Ally will bring Rex. It's going to be the whole family, and it's going to be rough. Hunter shrugged. Do you not want me to go? Because if it bothers you, I won't. No, you should go. If you want to that is. I wish they'd waited to meet you until Jack and Aaron's wedding, but apparently the rumors have become too much to wait. Why are there rumors about us? Didn't you hear Spike? We danced in the gazebo. 
people saw us together. That's almost like giving me an engagement ring in a small town like Silver Springs. He sighed. I guess I'm meeting the family then, huh? She nodded. I guess you are. Just be ready for them all to ask you questions at the same time. Don't worry though. If it gets too bad, I'll stab my brother with a fork, and that will take the attention from you. Maybe we should set up some kind of signal so you know when to stab him. Becca shrugged. You think you're joking, but that's really not a bad idea. They can't be that bad. Just you wait. Becca cleaned up the kitchen, shaking her head. She'd never in her life taken a man home to meet her parents. It was going to be an interesting weekend. Chapter 7 Becca met Hunter on the front porch 30 minutes before they had to be at her parents' house. Are you sure you're up to this? she asked. She knew she wasn't, because she knew what her family was like. Hopefully he would be able to handle it without too much trouble. Hunter smiled at her, taking her hand. You're really nervous about this, aren't you? I'm supposed to be the one nervous about meeting your family. Not the other way around. She shrugged. My family is insane. If you've never been part of a big family, then you won't get it until you see them in action. I'm not afraid of your family, he said softly, walking her to his car. I'll drive unless you want to. No, go for it. I'm so nervous I'd probably wreck. Are you sure you want to do this? It's not too late to back out. He laughed. I never thought you'd be so nervous about anything. You're the only one who can handle Jennifer, remember? Uh-huh. I'm also the only one who knows what they're getting into here. She got into the passenger seat and buckled up. It's a ten-minute drive. Or we could walk. He ignored her nervousness, starting the car. Just tell me where to go. She gave him the kind of directions he hated. Turn right at the big white house. Now, left at the house with the red playhouse in the yard. When they had parked on the street, she sighed. We're really going through with this, aren't we? He got out and walked around to open her door. You're not staying in the car. We're in this together. He still wasn't sure why he'd been summoned, but he looked forward to meeting her family. It was nice to pretend, if only for a little while, that they really did have a future. When they got to the door, he raised his hand to knock, but she turned the knob and walked right in. An older man was standing in the living room, and he grabbed Becca in a bear hug. I know you're busy with your band B, but you need to make more time to visit your mother. I was here last week, Dad. She stepped back. This is Hunter. Hunter, my dad, Bob Roberts. Hunter grinned at the man's name. Your parents had a sense of humor, didn't they? Bob grinned. They did. Sometimes I think too much of one, but it's cool to be a Bob. I mean, who isn't envious of someone named Bob? My favorite writer is trying to get Bobalicious into the dictionary. You should meet her, Dad. Becca grinned, wondering how her dad would act with a Bob worshipper like Jolene Gold. I have a t-shirt my wife bought me that says, Bob, the man, the myth, the legend. Hunter laughed, pulling out his notebook and jotting something down quickly. At her dad's quizzical look, Becca told him, he does that all the time. He's a writer. Her dad shrugged. I'd think he'd make notes with a phone, but whatever. Are we the first to get here? She glanced at the time on her phone. It's ten till. We thought we should have you two come first, so we could get to know your hunter, before the chaos ensued. Her mother stepped out of the kitchen, holding her hand out to Hunter to shake. I'm Christina Roberts. It's so good to meet you. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Roberts. Hunter tucked his notebook back into his pocket before shaking her hand. Your daughter favors you. Thanks for not saying you know where her good looks come from. That line is so overdone, and with three daughters, I've heard it more than any woman ever should. 
well, I am a writer. I try to make my lines a little more original than that. Do you need help in the kitchen, Mom? Becca asked softly, knowing her mother would understand her unspoken plea. I do. Would you make the salad? Christina tucked her hand through her daughter's arm, pulling her away. What's up? She kept her voice down so only Becca would hear. I feel funny about bringing him here. We haven't even been out on a date yet. Yet. You have feelings for him, though. I can see it in your eyes, and Spike said the same thing after seeing you together yesterday. Why does it make you nervous that he's here? Becca shrugged. I've never brought a guy home before. You know that. I feel like the whole family is making something more out of this than there really is. Oh? So you're not head over heels in love with him? From the first instant our eyes met. Well, not quite. He was a pain for the first few minutes, but, yeah. I have feelings. Strong feelings. He thinks I'm a flirt, though, because of what Jack said about me the other day. And then Jordan. Who's Jordan? Her mother's brows were drawn together. I haven't heard you talk about a Jordan. He's a guy I've gone out dancing with a couple of times. I'm not in love with him. I have no feelings for him at all really, but he's a good dancer. He told Hunter that I leave a trail of broken hearts behind me. Mom laughed softly. You? You make it very clear that you're just having fun with every man you go out with. I know better than that. Why did he say that? No idea. I think he thought he was being funny, but Hunter believed him. How am I supposed to convince him that I'm not really like that now? Becca, stop worrying. If it's meant to be, it will happen. Mom stirred the spaghetti sauce, while Becca dug in the fridge, pulling out lettuce, tomatoes, and fresh spinach from the fridge. I guess. It just feels like everything is stacked against me. I'm surprised he was even willing to come here after everything that was said about me. Someone needs to duct tape Jack's mouth shut. I'm surprised Erin didn't stop him from talking, because she was there too. She may have thought that trying to get him to shut up would have drawn more attention to him. I don't know. I know Erin would never deliberately upset you. She's not that type. Becca sighed. I know she's not. I'm just annoyed. I want Hunter to only hear good things about me, and there he is listening to the whole world say stuff that's only partially true. I mean, I recognize that there's a small grain of truth in it all. I do tend to date a lot of different men, but it's casual. I don't even kiss them. I know that, and you know that. It won't be long before Hunter knows it too. If he believes the worst, then he's not the man you're looking for anyway. Becca heard the front door open, and there was the sound of a child yelling, Grandma Roberts. I'm here. Christina dropped the spoon she was using to stir the meat sauce and hurried into the living room, her arms spread wide. It's my Ethan. She scooped him up in her arms and spun him in a little circle. Ethan squealed. Hi. I came to see you. I see that you did. Christina smiled at Amy. Thanks for bringing my boy. Oh, absolutely. I know it wouldn't be a real family dinner without Ethan. Amy and Spike had been a thing for quite a while, but there was no ring in sight. The whole family was hoping it would happen soon. Spike smiled at Becca, who was hovering in the doorway, watching to see how things played out. There's my favorite youngest sister. You saw me yesterday, Spike. Don't start trying to get on my good side. I didn't bring muffins. You're dead to me. Spike turned away to their dad. Where are Ally and Rex? Should be here any minute. Ally called to ask if they should bring something half an hour ago, and said they'd be leaving in a minute. Mike's the only sister you won't get to meet, Becca told Hunter. She's a professional skier, and she's out of town, as usual. She's still recuperating from a knee injury. 
She should be recuperating at home. Christina complained. Hunter looked at her with confusion. Mike's a girl? Christina sighed. Michaela is her full name. She and Michael are twins, and they started calling each other Spike and Mike when they were tiny. I'm tired of fighting it. Hunter smiled. I think it's nice. We don't have nicknames in our family. My brother is Ryder, and that's what everyone calls him. Nicknames are fun. All right, put and pop. Becca grinned at him as she came up with a nickname for him out of the blue. One she knew he wouldn't appreciate, but he seemed to like the big family teasing atmosphere of her parents' house, so he could be part of it. Spike grinned, his evil side clearly showing. Put and pop is perfect. He took Ethan away from Christina. Ethan, this is your future Uncle Puddin Pop. Hi, Uncle Puddin Pop, Ethan said obediently, making everyone in the room laugh. Hunter shook his head at Becca. Now I fit in. Not quite sure how I feel about that silly name, but I fit. You need to get used to the fact that things just don't usually go how you plan them in a family this size. Becca winked at Spike knowing they would have fun with the whole put and pop thing as the night wore on. Spike wasn't one to ever let something like that go. Ally and Rex were the last to arrive, and as soon as they'd been introduced to Hunter, Mom said, now that everyone's here, we'll get supper on the table so we can eat. Becca hurried off to help her mom, Ally, and Amy right behind her. You know, next time I think we should let the men serve us, Becca suggested as they carried everything to the table. Amy laughed. Yeah right. It's a thought. Becca said with a grin. So tell me about Hunter. How serious are you guys? Amy asked. Spike said there seemed to be a lot of tension between you yesterday. Becca sighed. We haven't even gone out on a date yet. So what's this all about? Amy asked. Well, I'm madly in love with him. There's that. Ally laughed. You finally found a man who was up to your standards, did you? I didn't think it would ever happen, Becca said. I just wish he felt the same. Mom gave Becca a one-armed hug. He does. You can see it in his eyes when he looks at you. You think? Becca asked, looking toward the living room. I hope so. Five minutes later, everyone was seated around the table, and that's when the real fun began. Someone passed the garlic bread, Spike said. What's the magic word? Becca asked, her eyes full of mischief. Abracadabra. Ethan shouted, obviously loving the chaos the big family brought into his life. Please, Spike said, groaning as he was forced to say it. Becca tossed a piece of the bread at her brother, grinning as he caught it. You're welcome. Me next. Ethan shouted. Pass me the bread. Becca laughed and tossed a piece right onto the boy's plate. There you go. Amy groaned. He doesn't need to learn bad manners from you people. Spike nodded to support Amy. He really doesn't. I teach him enough bad stuff when we're alone together. Amy elbowed Spike in the ribs. That's not exactly what I meant. Hunter watched everyone as they ate, keeping his notebook open beside him and jotting things down every once in a while. You guys are great. You don't mind if I base a family in a book on you, do you? He was already envisioning his hero going to Becca's house for dinner and this kind of a chaotic meal happening. He loved the idea, and he knew his readers would eat it up. Just so no one can trace it back to us. I don't want people to know that my grown children throw things at each other at the dinner table, Christina replied, her gaze settling on Becca. Becca smiled sweetly. Sorry, Mom. No, you're not. Mom shook her head. You're a mess, Rebecca and, and you know it. At least I haven't stabbed Spike with my fork yet. Spike groaned. Not since last month. You were going for the last piece of cake, and it was my birthday cake. 
you deserved it and you know it. Becca shrugged, not at all contrite. Every day I ask God what I did to deserve such heathens. I raised them right. I swear to you, I did. Christina's eyes were on Hunter as she said it. I'm sure you did, ma'am. It's not your fault they all have a tendency to misbehave any more than it's your fault that they all have a crooked smile. Hunter's eyes were on Becca's grin, lopsided, as always. Christina laughed. I fell in love with that crooked smile a whole lot of years ago. I can't regret that all of my children inherited it. After dessert, Hunter found himself in the kitchen, helping clean up. Why are only the men clearing the table and doing dishes? he asked Spike. Because the women cook or some such nonsense. Mom made the rule a long time ago, and we're all afraid to contradict it. Spike rinsed a plate before putting it in the dishwasher. Hunter grinned. He liked the family more with every new thing he learned. Works for me. An hour later, he and Becca were on their way back to the band B. I'm not sure what you were afraid of. Becca smiled. They were on their best behavior. Are you sure about that? She shrugged. In front of me they were. Your brother told me that it's my duty to make sure that you never stab him again, and I should duct tape your hands and feet together and leave you in the gazebo the next time I come over to ensure you can't hurt him. She grinned. Sounds like Spike. He's a mess and a half. And you love him with everything inside you. Hunter loved knowing that she felt so much for the man who had obviously tormented her throughout her childhood. Of course I do. He's my brother. He'd kill anyone who hurt me, so I can't complain even one little bit. Hunter grinned as he parked the car in the small parking lot of the Band B. It's dark. Do you want to go for a walk? She nodded. I'd love to. For this walk, she left the grounds of the Band B and took him to walk down by the river. It feels so much more romantic here at night, don't you think? Here in town? Or down by the river? She shrugged. Does it matter? It feels romantic, because I'm with you. He frowned. You sound like you really believe we might have a future after my time here is up. She stopped walking, sitting down on a park bench to listen to the ripples from the river. I hope we have a future. I couldn't stand it if you decided that I wasn't good enough to be in your life. Good enough? He turned to her, taking her hands in his. My worry is that you're too good to be in my life. I've been almost a recluse for years. I mean I get together with friends and we play role-playing games on occasion, but for the most part, I've been alone for a very long time. Role-playing games? I can't wait to tell Spike about that. You'll never hear the end of it, Pud and Pop. I can't believe you have everyone calling me that. Your mother's right. You are a mess, Becca Ann. I don't care if you're a recluse. You let me into your life. She looked down at their joined hands. I've never felt the way I feel about you for anyone. It's strange. I know I've dated more than you, because we've talked about it, but I feel like I'm totally out of my league here. You're not. I promise. We've had the same number of serious relationships, and I think that's what really matters, she said. There had to be someone you were at least a little bit serious about. She laughed. Never. I always knew in the back of my mind that when I saw the man who I was meant to spend my whole life with, I'd know it. And I did. He leaned down and brushed his lips against hers, not sure how else to respond. How did you tell a girl that you thought you were falling in love with her as well, but you were afraid? Not of commitment, but afraid that she was making a mistake that she'd later regret. Chapter 8 Tuesday morning Becca and Hunter met in the dining room of the Band B. They'd both slept until right before breakfast ended and had a leisurely breakfast together. Jennifer was Bree's responsibility for the day, and she seemed to be doing well. She had already cleaned half of the rooms, and Becca had checked up on her, 
thrilled with the work she'd done. Looks like you're only going to have to work for me for a week, Jennifer. I'm almost sad that I'm going to have to do my own work again. Jennifer smiled. I can't believe I'm actually doing it right. I was starting to think there was no way for me to ever learn to do it. You have a real skill when it comes to cleaning potties. Jennifer frowned. Are you insulting me? Not at all. I'm really proud of how well you've stepped up and learned to do the job. If she'd been told a week before that Jennifer would actually scrub a toilet correctly, without complaint, she'd never have believed it. And you'll tell my parents that? Of course I will. Becca looked at Bree. Are you two going to be okay together all day? Bree nodded. As long as she doesn't do something evil, we'll be fine. If that happens, I'm calling you to come back, though. Becca leveled her gaze at Jennifer. Are you going to behave all day and do what Bree tells you to do? I'll try. Jennifer still hated to work with Bree, and it was obvious, but she was at least trying. It was more than Becca ever thought would happen. Bree gave Becca two of her boxed lunches, packed in bags for the four-wheelers. You two have fun. Any idea where you're going? I want to take him out to the lake. I think he'll find it as beautiful as I do. Have a great day. Hunter came into the kitchen then. I'm ready when you are. Did you finish your book? I forgot to ask. Becca knew he'd been close, but he hadn't been sure if he'd be able to get it finished, before bed the night before. I was up until four, but I got it done. Now I can spend the next three weeks on edits. So excited. I take it you don't like edits? I hate them, as does any writer worth his salt. Becca took his hand, pulling him outside and toward the shed where the four-wheelers were stored when not in use. There were a couple of snowmobiles there as well. If it was February, would you have asked me to go snowmobiling instead? Of course. Would have been just as fun, but I wouldn't have been able to see your shoulders quite as well under your snow gear. And why do you need to see my shoulders? Well, I don't need to I guess, but they are some mighty fine-looking shoulders. Don't tell me you have a thing for men's shoulders? He shook his head. You know, men are allowed to be all about breasts, or legs, or butts, but if a woman admits she's into butts or shoulders, people act like she's done something wrong. She sighed as she climbed onto her four-wheeler and put her helmet on, fastening it under her chin. Do you know how to ride a four-wheeler? He shook his head. It's not something I've ever done, but it can't be that complicated, can it? She gave him a quick lesson on the controls before she drove out of the shed. We'll stick to the easy paths, since this is your first time. There are hard paths? She laughed. There are very hard paths, and some of them lead to the lake. We don't need you flipping on your first time out, though. I'll do my best. It didn't take him long to understand the appeal of the small vehicles. She took them along a path through some woods, and over some log bridges. These were definitely places that he wouldn't have been able to go in a car, and wouldn't have cared to go on foot. Finally, they reached a couple of large rocks, and she pulled over and got off the four-wheeler. So what do you think? I love it. The view is amazing. His eyes were on her, and she looked at him with a smile. I'm glad you like my place. I come out here whenever I get a chance to get away. Sometimes I come by snowmobile, but I really prefer to drive the four-wheelers. I like to come out here and watch the water. It's so peaceful. Do you mind if I take some quick notes? I know I'm supposed to be taking the day off, but as a writer, every person I meet and every new experience is future book fodder. I'm never truly off. I don't mind at all. She spread out a small blanket over one of the rocks and set their picnic out. Bree had included two sandwiches, some chips, some of her raspberry lemonade, and brownies for dessert. She had already taken a couple of bites of her sandwich when he joined her. 
Thanks for waiting for me, he said, his voice full of sarcasm. Any time. I'm here for you, Pud and Pop. After they ate, he sighed, looking out over the water. Do we have to head back right away? She shook her head. No, not at all. It's a little chilly up this high, but there's no reason to leave this early. He picked up their picnic and deposited it in a trash can near them, coming back to her and wrapping the red plaid blanket they'd used for the picnic around their shoulders. How's that? Cozy, she said with a grin. I'm glad you took my advice and wore a sweater. I was afraid you'd ignore me and freeze. I try to listen to people who know more about things than I do. You're a very smart man. She rested her head on his shoulder. Thank you for agreeing to come out here today. I'm glad we didn't just do something boring in town. You can't really get to know someone at a movie theater or over dinner in a restaurant. You need real time together. His arm came around her and he pulled her closer. You make me believe that we can really make a go of this sometimes, and then someone like Jordan comes along, and I hear about all the broken hearts you leave in your wake. She sighed. I promise you, if I ever broke a heart, it was the guy's fault and not mine. I'm always clear and upfront that all I'm looking for is a fun time, that I want nothing serious. Do you really think that I would be as honest and upfront with what I want from you as I have been and lead other guys on? It's just not in me to mince words. He frowned. I have noticed that about you. He shook his head. Your own cousin Jack warned me to be careful about you though. He was kidding. You know my family teases. You've seen us at it. This is true. She couldn't bear the subject any longer. If he wasn't going to take her at her word, she'd talk about something else. Tell me about your book. I'm not sure what there is to tell. I have the same hero in every book. This is my third. He wasn't sure if he should mention that his hero was finding love with a beautiful woman named Becca in this book. Would she even believe him? And did you kill off a beautiful woman named Jennifer? He laughed. No, but I almost went back and changed the name of one of the victims to Jennifer. One of the victims, she asked. Do you always have more than one? He nodded. Oh yeah. My hero is an FBI profiler. He always finds mass murderers. E.W. It's hard to believe something that dark lies in your brain. You seem like such a good guy. He grinned. I have a fun story about that. At my last job before I quit to be a full-time writer, I was sitting there one day, and the FBI showed up at my work. They went to my boss and said that someone who worked there had searched for how to make bombs on the internet. Her eyes grew wide and she looked up at him with a grin. And? My boss turned to me and said, Hunter, the FBI wants to talk to you. Becca laughed, the sound filling the air and echoing. They didn't mind that you did that kind of search on company time? Everyone knew I wrote during my lunch hours. It didn't surprise anyone at all. Hunter kissed the top of her head, a smile on his face. I quit a couple of weeks later, because my contracts wouldn't let me work two full-time jobs. I never looked back. Do you like what you do? Ever wish you'd done something else? I love what I do. I write because there are stories inside me. It wouldn't matter to me if I never made a dime writing, because I can't not write, if that makes sense. He shook his head. Of course, it's nice that what I love to do pays the bills. I'm sure it is. I feel the same way about the band B. We're already making a bit of a profit. Enough to pay all our debts, and we have a bit of money left over to live on. I've always known this is what I wanted to do, so it makes me happy. Really? He was surprised. He'd never known anyone who aspired to be a band B owner. Did people even do that? She nodded. When Bree and I were little, we'd ignore the dolls that were there for us to play with, and instead we'd play band B. Bree would help Grandma in the kitchen, 
and I'd go outside and work on the yard. We made our siblings crazy. I'm sure you did. I think it's neat you have a cousin who is so close in age to you, who you get along with so well. I don't think it would have mattered if we hadn't gotten along. We would have been pushed at each other all the time anyway. Getting along was just a plus. The school was small enough that we were in the same classes all through elementary school. It was always nice to have a built-in best friend. She shrugged. I honestly think that's why Jennifer focused so hard on Bree. She could tell that the two of us had a bond that the other kids didn't have. So she tried to make us hate each other, and when that didn't work, she tried to make Bree miserable. She was in your classes in school too? Becca nodded. From the first day of kindergarten. She was even in a lot of our classes in college. It was miserable. I haven't really seen her since that day you guys had lunch and I asked her about Hall and Oates. I wonder what she thought of that. I never told you about that, she said with a laugh. She came to me Monday and said she'd listened to Hall and Oates all weekend, trying to figure out which song you meant was about her. She decided it was, you make my dreams come true. She thinks you're in love with her. He groaned. You've got to be kidding me. I never kid about Jennifer. There's no need. She's entertaining, just by being her. Did Jordan ever ask her out? Becca shrugged. I rarely see Jordan. He's kind of a pain in my backside. He's always trying to get me to go out with him, but I know what he wants is really just sex, and he's not getting that from me. Why not? he asked. She frowned at him. Because I don't sleep around. I've never, well, I always thought I'd wait until after I got married to have sex. Really? He looked at her curiously. I always figured if a girl dated a lot she was, well, putting out sounds childish. But accurate? You assumed that about me? She wrinkled her nose. I told you I'd never had a serious relationship. What did you think that meant? That you'd never been in love. I didn't think it meant you'd never slept with anyone. Well. She frowned, staring out over the water. I had no idea you thought so little of me. How is that thinking little of you? I didn't mean that I thought you were loose or anything. Loose? For a writer, you sure aren't very good with words. She stood up. I think maybe it's time for us to get back. He caught her arm. Becca, I'm sorry. Don't be mad at me. She stood looking at him for a moment, shaking her head. I just didn't realize you thought my morals were lacking. That hurts. He closed his eyes for a moment, realizing he'd said the absolute worst thing he could have. Please stay. I'm not ready to go back yet. And maybe if she stayed, he'd figure out how to unsay the words that had hurt her. She sighed, sitting back down beside him, but making sure they didn't touch at all. Is it because I kissed you first? I've never done that before, but I thought you were shy, and I couldn't wait anymore. I've never felt about anyone the way I feel about you. I keep telling you that, but you won't listen to me. I barely know you. You know me well enough to have come to some very erroneous conclusions. She stood up, walking over to the four-wheeler she'd ridden. I need chocolate. She pulled the box of Frank's fudge from the storage box. She also grabbed a couple bottles of water, taking one to him. She offered him a piece of chocolate from the box. He took a piece and bit into it, surprised by the creamy taste of the chocolate and caramel. This is really good chocolate. Best I've ever had. She took a piece for herself. I think we need to start over. Start over? Like as if we're just meeting? As if you're just forming opinions of me. I'm Becca Roberts. I own a band B with my favorite cousin Bree. I come from a big noisy family who loves each other very much, and I have a secret thing for mystery writers. So secret even I didn't know I had it until last week. His lips curved up. 
If she was introducing herself that way, she'd forgiven him. I'm Hunter Sloan. I'm a reclusive mystery writer who has no idea how to talk to women without sticking his foot in his mouth, and I have this thing for small-town girls who own band BS. Oh? Is that so? She scooched a little closer to him. Tell me what you think of these small-town girls. Well, how about I start out with how much I think about them? Which is all the time. In fact, I named a character in my book after this pretty girl I met last week. You killed me in a book? Her eyes widened. I know I interrupted your work that first night, but... Her words were cut off by his mouth crushing down on hers. His arms came around her, and he held her close to him. I didn't kill you. I made my hero fall in love with you. She pulled back, her eyes skeptical. Really? He nodded. Really? I'll show you when we get back to the band B if you want. I'd like that a lot. She needed to know if he was telling her the truth. I even have a kissing scene. I've never written a kissing scene in my life. She laughed. What did you write for your kissing scene? I had Becca, this beautiful girl my hero falls for, offer to go for a walk with the hero to give him some details about his case. He meets her because she's a witness, you see. And while they're walking, she grabs the front of his shirt with both hands and pulls him down for a kiss. Becca grinned. You really wrote that? I sure did. I've never met a girl who kissed me that way before, and I liked it. A lot. I couldn't not write about it. She laughed. My family is going to read that and know that's what I did. She shook her head. What will they think of me? The same thing I did at the time. They'll think you're a brutally honest, beautiful woman who knows how to get what she wants in life. If you hadn't kissed me, we'd be sitting here right now, still wondering what it would be like to kiss. Oh, you'd have kissed me by now, wouldn't you? He shook his head. Probably not until we got back today. I wouldn't have had the guts to go for it until after the first date. He brushed her lips with his. See? You made things so much easier for me by being bold and honest. I'm glad. She rested her head on his shoulder once again, knowing her anger had already dissipated. She'd never been good at holding a grudge, even against someone like Jennifer. I'd be going crazy if you hadn't kissed me yet. I'd spend all my time wondering if I'd make it through until you did it. And? What do you think of kissing me now? She laughed. I think you have the kisses that cause the most electricity in the world. You send electric shocks right through me every time. And Jordan? He never got more than a hug and a kiss on the cheek. Trust me, Hunter. You have no equal in my eyes. Surprisingly, he did trust her. How on earth had he found such a sweet woman who was just right for him? He hadn't even been looking. Chapter 9 After that first date together, Hunter made time for Becca every evening. They grew more and more comfortable with one another and became closer. She was careful not to mention how she felt to him again because she knew he needed time to come to grips with her. She was a little too outspoken, a little too focused on what she wanted and needed for most men. On the Wednesday when he had first intended to leave, before he'd been invited to the wedding and decided to stay for it, she was on her knees beside the gazebo, carefully planting daisies around the structure. Aaron's favorite flowers were daisies, so they were getting everything ready for the wedding on Saturday. Jack and Aaron had decided to marry at the band B, and had offered to pay for the venue, but Bree and Becca had refused. They were paying for ingredients, but the location was free. She saw a pair of tennis shoes appear, attached to some jean-clad legs. Hey! Looking up she saw Hunter there, smiling down at her. Hi. You need some help? he asked. What about your edits? I thought you had to get those finished before Friday so you could be my date to the wedding on Saturday? She'd never had a date for a big family event before. 
She knew her extended family would be all over him, insisting they needed to know him better. Just sent them off to my editor. So happy to be done with that book. We'll see what they think about the addition of Becca. She grinned at him, standing up and brushing the dirt from her hands. I had to plant these, and I finished. Now I have to go play general kitchen lackey for Brie. She's doing the catering for the wedding, and there's still a lot to be done. Being a kitchen lackey doesn't sound like as much fun as digging in the dirt, but I can offer my services there too. Becca sighed. It doesn't sound like much fun to me either, but I'm good at being bossed around by Brie. He laughed, putting his arm around her waist and pulling her to him, kissing the top of her head. We'll make it fun. When they got into the house, Aaron was there ready to help, as well as Jennifer. The transformation Jennifer had made since she'd first been assigned to work with Becca was amazing. She now knew the meaning of hard work, and she was there to help with whatever she could. Jennifer looked up when she saw Becca come in with Hunter, a frown on her face. Why did you say you thought of a Hall and Oates song when you saw me, when it's clear you have feelings for Becca? Jennifer asked Hunter. He sighed. It was kind of a joke between Becca and me. I'm sorry about that. Hunter did his best to keep a straight face. He never should have said that to her, and he knew it. Jennifer frowned. Okay, well I'm here for work. Tell me to do something, bossy Brie. Becca grinned. That's nicer than what I call her. I usually go for bossy but. Brie made a face. If you two can't be nice, I'll kick you both out of my kitchen. Aaron laughed. How do I get kicked out? We're doing this for you, Aaron soon to be Roberts. I know. I know. I'm here to work and I'll enjoy said work. Erin went to the sink and washed her hands carefully, scrubbing up to her elbows. She was a nurse, and some habits never died. Once everyone was scrubbed up, Brie gave them all tasks. I'm going to make the lasagna. Becca, you're in charge of sausage rolls, Hunter can help with that. Jennifer, you're going to be chopping veggies, and I want you to keep the dishes going as we finish each thing we're working on. Erin? You get to tie little ribbons around the bottles of bubbles you're handing out. She had set up various workstations around the kitchen, and as everyone moved where they'd been told, she put on some show tunes for them to listen to. Becca had made sausage rolls many times, because they were one of the family's favorite things for get-togethers. They were almost no work, and they were something she could easily do. She sat down at the table and showed Hunter what to do. As soon as he was ready, she asked Aaron, how are plans going? Everyone have dresses? Yeah. Brie and Emma have pretty mint green dresses. Not the color I was looking for, but they work, and they don't need to be altered. Where's Emma today anyway? Becca asked. Her cousin was usually one of the first to volunteer for a task like this. She's running some errands for me, Aaron responded. I am so errand out, I could scream. Weddings are hard work. Brie turned from her sauce. They really are. I thought it would be so easy to just throw something together at the last minute and call it a wedding. There was so much more involved than I'd imagined there would be. Not that I'm complaining, because I'm married to Anthony, and he's the man of my dreams, but it was definitely work. Becca shrugged. When I marry, I'm going to find a cousin who's in the process of planning a wedding and tell them it's a double wedding. That way I won't have to do as much work. Brie laughed. You're the only person I know who could actually get away with making that happen. We have enough cousins. I think we could make anything happen. Jennifer turned from the sink, she was washing vegetables. You know, I've always envied you guys. You have this huge family of people that have to love you. Only my parents ever had to love me, and that strained them a great deal at times. Brie frowned at Jennifer. Erin has always been one of us too, even before she decided to marry into the family. 
We've always extended our love to people who love one of our own. If you'd befriended Becca or me, you'd have been let in, no questions asked. Now you tell me. I've only been trying to figure out the secret for what? Eighteen years? Becca laughed. You could have asked, instead of being mean. I probably should have. Jennifer shrugged. At least you're all accepting me now. Aaron looked at Jennifer skeptically, as if she was trying to figure out why she was being so nice for a change. You've changed, Jennifer. We like seeing you be nice instead of nasty. Aaron looked over at Becca. I sure wish you'd tell me that you're sharing my wedding with me. As much as I love Jack, I'm nervous about being the center of attention on Saturday. Hunter felt uncomfortable with the conversation. Didn't they even realize he was there? Who were they thinking of for Becca to marry? Becca's not marrying anyone but me, so you can just get that idea out of your head. Becca looked at Hunter, raising an eyebrow. Don't you think you should ask me, instead of announcing to the whole world that you're marrying me? He shrugged. Probably wouldn't be a bad idea, but the ring's up in my room. I'll do it later. Becca blinked at him. Ring? You carry an engagement ring with you when you travel? No, I went and bought one last week, after our day out together. I knew I'd be asking you eventually, probably before I leave to go home to Denver. I've been talking to your dad about property here too. You have? He nodded. I mean, you don't want to live above the band B after we have kids, do you? Have you lost your mind? Nope. You told me you wanted to get married and have kids. I'm just putting your plan in motion. Becca looked over at Aaron, who was doing her best not to laugh aloud. Have you ever in your life heard such a ridiculous marriage proposal? Aaron shook her head. I wouldn't call that a proposal at all. You know, I wouldn't either, but knowing Hunter, it's all I'm going to get. He'll see me later and toss the ring at me, box and all. Hunter tilted his head to one side, considering. Sounds like a good idea to me. I could go get it now and toss it to you, if you want me to. Becca sighed. I had dreams of a man going down on one knee in a park, and I get someone who announces he's looking for houses for us. Where did I go wrong? Hunter shook his head, going to the sink and washing his hands before leaving the room. Becca watched him go, an odd look on her face. Now where do you think he's going? Bree laughed. There's no telling with that man. You really have met your match, Becca. Jennifer watched them all, a lost expression on her face. I wish I had brothers and sisters, and cousins. Becca smiled at her. You need to marry into a big family then. Not ours of course, but a big family. Why not yours? Which one of my cousins do you think I'd use as a sacrificial lamb? Becca asked, grinning at Jennifer to let her know she was kidding. I guess that needs to be one of the first things I ask when I date someone new, huh? Whether or not they have a big family. Jordan from the hotel asked me out. He bought me some pretty tulips and a box of Frank's fudge. I don't know who Frank is, but I'd marry him just for that fudge of his. Bree laughed. The guy behind Frank's fudge stayed here with his wife a couple of weeks ago. He's super sweet, but his name is Al, not Frank. Then why is it Frank's fudge? Jennifer asked, a confused look on her face. His last name is Frank. Bree pulled out a box of chocolate, sharing a piece with everyone. I think we're going to start putting some of his chocolate in welcome baskets for all the guests. This stuff is amazing. Erin took a bite of hers, her eyes closing in ecstasy. This is amazing. I don't know what's different, but this is the best chocolate I've ever eaten. I know. Becca said, taking a bite of hers. What kind is this, Bree? It says, the Aaron on the box. It seems to be milk chocolate, caramel, and sea salt. Aaron is Ale's wife, Bree told the others, who hadn't met the couple. 
But you could claim to Jack that it's your very own chocolate, and you need to always have a supply since your name is Aaron as well. Hunter walked back into the room then, looking around. I leave for five minutes, and everyone stops working and eats chocolate. Becca shrugged. It's Frank's fudge. We couldn't resist. He shook his head, walked to Becca, and dropped a ring box in her lap. Consider yourself engaged. Becca glared at him. Just like that? You're not going to get down on one knee or declare your undying love for me? He shook his head. Nope. You said I'd throw the ring box at you. I dropped it in your lap. That's nicer than you expected, right? She sighed, opening the box to find a diamond surrounded by small emeralds. How did you know I love emeralds? He shrugged. I asked Bree. You should talk to her about running off at the mouth about you. I'm glad she told me what I wanted to know, but you might not want her to do that with all the guests. Becca looked over at Bree, who had conveniently needed to turn her back to everyone so she could stir the sauce. Her shoulders were shaking with mirth. I don't know if I should thank her or tell her to zip her lips. Bree smiled over her should. You're welcome. Aaron grinned. Becca, you know what this means? That I'm marrying a lunatic who got my crazed cousin to spill her guts about me. Becca slipped the ring on her finger, smiling when it fit perfectly. The ring does look nice, though, doesn't it? Beautiful, Aaron told her. But do you know what this means? Becca shrugged at Aaron. Something other than what I'm thinking, obviously. It means we can have a double wedding on Saturday. Aaron told her. Becca stared at Aaron for a minute. I don't even have a dress. You can wear mine. Bree said. I just got it back from the cleaners last week. It's all pressed and ready to go. Hunter has a suit for the wedding already, and he can wear that. Bree clapped excitedly. We can totally make this work. Becca looked at Hunter, expecting him to argue. Instead he said, sounds good to me. That's why I went and got the ring today. I don't want to have to go through the hassle of arranging a wedding. This way it's done quick. But, I can't take any time off for the honeymoon. Jennifer shook her head at Becca. Take a week. I'm not needed at the hotel, and I can come and work with Bree. It'll be my wedding gift to you. Becca looked at Bree, expecting to get some help from her. Bree? I think you should do it. Jennifer's gotten good at helping, and I'll find someone to mow the lawn for you. We have a riding lawnmower. It's not that difficult. Bree smiled at Jennifer. As long as you really will help me. Jennifer nodded. It's nice to feel needed for a change. Becca frowned. I, I can't just decide today to get married on Saturday, can I? Aaron nodded. You sure can. There's no waiting period in Colorado. Go get a marriage license tomorrow, and wear Bree's dress. We'll be the center of attention together. Everyone will think I'm pregnant. Becca exclaimed. Bree laughed. I think people will know you just wanted to have a cheap wedding by sharing with your cousin. No biggie. Becca finished cutting up the sausage rolls she was working on, her mind racing. I think I need to talk to the man alone for a minute. Make sure he's in his right mind and hasn't freaked himself out with this yet. She walked to the sink, washed her greasy hands, grabbed Hunter by the hand, and dragged him outside before anyone said anything. She heard the girls laughing behind her. What are you thinking? He shrugged. You said you'd like to just tell a cousin they were going to have a double wedding with you. I thought it would make things easier for you. She shook her head, trying to clear it. Are you serious? You've been against us getting married since we met. I have not. He caught her by the waist and pulled her to him. I had to make sure you were the right woman for me, and sometimes deciding who you're going to spend forever with takes more than a few minutes. 
I know that's how quickly you decided, but I couldn't. Now that I've gotten to know you, I want forever with you. And kids. Let's have a dozen kids or so, and then when they have kids, they'll all have cousins to tease and have fun with. Becca rested her forehead against his shoulder. Are you sure? I want you to be sure. If I tell people I'm getting married on Saturday, I don't want a runaway groom. I need to be able to go through with it. Some people think I'm flighty, and I don't want anyone thinking that any longer. He rubbed her back, holding her close. No one will think that ever again. I want to get married on Saturday. He cupped her face in his hands, looking deeply into her eyes. Becca? Will you be my wife? Please? She nodded slowly. My mom is going to have a fit. He laughed. I thought she liked me. Oh, she does. But she's not expecting me to marry quickly. She thinks she should get to help plan the wedding. All the more reason to do it fast. Call your mom and tell her. Right now? Well, in a minute. Okay, what are we waiting for? She asked, her brows drawn together in confusion. Well, I thought we needed this first. He lowered his head and kissed her, giving her what she considered a toe-curling kiss, a kiss that made her want to hold on and never let go. When he pulled away she was out of breath. Now call your mama. The date is non-negotiable. He waited as she dug her phone out of her pocket. Mom? Hey, Becca. I thought you were helping get stuff ready for the wedding this afternoon. Her mom sounded distracted. Are you with a client? Becca asked. No, but I'm on my way to meet one. What's going on? I'm getting married on Saturday. You should probably pick out a mother of the bride dress. I'll see you then. Becca ended the call as her mother started sputtering. That was fun. Who else can I call? He laughed softly. Call anyone you want. We're getting married on Saturday. I couldn't be happier. Chapter 10 The next two days passed in a whirl. Becca and Hunter got their marriage license on Thursday afternoon and had lunch out. They had eaten a lot of meals together, but never in a restaurant oddly enough. Most had been at the Band B, with the occasional picnic. And the one crazy meal with her family at her parents' house. Hunter was in the mood for Italian food, so they went to the Italian bistro, there in Silver Springs. They were halfway through the meal when she saw her brother approaching her, a determined look on his face. He sat down adjacent to her and said, Dad told me to find out if you're pregnant. Becca looked at Hunter. I told you people would assume that. She kicked him under the table. Hunter shook his head at Spike. She's not pregnant. I just don't want to wait. Is that so hard to believe? Not to me, Spike said, reaching for a breadstick. I don't even want to think about my baby sister doing anything to get pregnant, because she's so sweet and virginal and will be till the day she dies. Any babies will be immaculate conception for sure. Becca rolled her eyes. So even after we're married, we're not allowed to do each other? Spike choked on his breadstick, taking her water and gulping down half of it in one swallow. Not even then. And you shouldn't be talking about that in front of him. He might think something. She looked at Hunter. Aren't you glad I don't have the same ideas about things my brother does? Very. Hunter brought her fingers to his lips. Go away, Spike. Spike stood up. Well, I never. Me neither, but I'm going to after I'm married. Becca told him, waving her hand in a shooing motion. Hunter watched as his future brother-in-law left the restaurant. What was that all about? Spike's an idiot. I haven't mentioned that to you before. He grinned. I thought you just said that, because he's your brother. That's only a small part of it. Asterisk. Becca woke earlier than usual on Saturday morning. 
She wanted to sleep in, but the wedding was at ten, and she was usually still sleeping then. She quickly showered, putting on her undergarments and a robe. She knew her family would be up there any minute. She and Bree had done the same thing they did for Bree's wedding. They discounted the price of the room for the night before the wedding, because they had no intention of serving breakfast on a wedding day of one of their own. At shortly after eight, there was a knock on her door, and all of the female relatives came in, carrying wedding dresses, and bridesmaid dresses, and makeup and curling irons, and everything else they could possibly need for a wedding. Bree handed her wedding gown to Becca. I'll help you put it on. Becca had tried it on, but she'd wanted Bree to keep it until she was ready to wear it. She didn't trust herself not to show it to Hunter, and he wasn't supposed to see the dress until the wedding day. Her two-bedroom suite was filled with family. Aaron was in the other room getting ready, helped by Emma, and Bree pushed Becca down onto her bed, immediately fixing her hair. Just think, it was only seven or eight months ago when you were fixing my hair for my first date with Anthony. Now I'm an old married woman and you are getting married. Life is so strange. The door opened again, and Jennifer slipped inside. How can I help? Becca looked at Jennifer. No idea. Unless you want to work on cleaning rooms and start early? Jennifer nodded. I will. I know just how you like to have them cleaned. She put her hand on the door to leave and then turned back. Best wishes, Becca. I hope you're happy. You deserve to be. Thank you. Becca watched Jennifer go, seeing her cousin Molly's shocked look. Hey, people can change. Molly was a pretty brunette, who had come early, already dressed for the wedding. She sat on Becca's bed, watching everyone rushing around. I didn't think she could. Becca shrugged. Neither did the rest of us. Bree poked Becca's shoulder. Hold still. You're going to mess up your hair. Becca sighed, staring straight ahead. Is Amy here? Amy should be here getting ready with us. Her mom shrugged. Spike said she was staying home to get Ethan ready, but they'll be at the wedding. I hate it that Mike isn't here, Becca said sadly. Me too. But you didn't give anyone time. And now that she's hurt herself, Mom let the words trail off, obviously upset that her oldest daughter was injured. I should have waited to marry. Maybe I'll go tell Hunter that we should wait until December. Why December? Bree asked. Becca shrugged. Because today seems awfully scary at the moment. I have a feeling Hunter would not accept your line of reasoning, Bree said with a laugh. There was a knock on the door, and Jennifer stepped in. Hunter asked me to give you this. She handed a small box to Becca. Thank you. Becca said, tearing into the cardboard box. It wasn't wrapped, but that didn't surprise her a bit. Not when it was coming from Hunter. When she was finally into the box, she found a small box of chocolates labeled, Frank's Fudge, and she smiled. He's so good to me. She kept digging and found a small jewelry box. And it was a gold necklace with a laptop pendant. She grinned, pulling out the note that was at the bottom of the box. You inspire me, Hunter. Becca handed the necklace to Molly, who was sitting behind her. Her cousin put it around her neck and fastened it. Thanks for bringing that to me, Jennifer. Jennifer nodded, grinning. I'll just go finish working. Becca touched the pendant, a smile on her face. He hadn't said he loved her yet, but she knew he did. He wouldn't have given her such a sweet gift otherwise. Would he? Asterisk. Hunter was sitting in his room completely ready for the wedding when he realized he hadn't told his parents he'd be getting married. They weren't a tight-knit family like the Roberts, but they still had a right to know he was marrying. He grabbed his phone and called his mother's cell phone. Hey, Mom. Hunter? Are you okay? It's not my birthday, or Mother's Day. I wanted to tell you I'm getting married. 
her comment cut him to the quick. Did he really only call on her birthday and Mother's Day? He thought back to the last time he'd called her and realized she was probably right. Of course, she hadn't called him since his birthday either. Married? Do you need us to help pay for the wedding? No, I just thought you'd want to know. Of course I want to know. What's her name? He heard some background noise, and it sounded like she'd just sat down. It's Becca. Short for Rebecca. She runs a bed and breakfast in Silver Springs. Isn't that a ski town? Yeah. It's really nice here. You're there now? What are you doing in Silver Springs? He needed to talk to his mother more often. It was that simple. I was having trouble with a book, so I came here to finish it, hoping that a change of scenery would inspire me. It did, and I finished the book. Oh, that's nice. So how long have you known this Becky? I met her three and a half weeks ago. He waited for her to tell him he hadn't known her long enough to be engaged, and ignored the fact that she used the wrong name. That's not very long, she said softly. Are you sure about this, Hunter? Is she just marrying you for your money? He laughed. No, Mom, I don't think she has any idea how much money I have. I don't think it's even occurred to her to wonder about my financial situation. He rubbed the back of his neck. The thing is we're getting married in about twenty minutes. Today? You're marrying her today, and you're just now telling me? He sighed. Phones worked both ways, but he didn't tell her that. Sorry, Mom. Yeah, we're getting married today. We just decided on Wednesday, so it's been kind of quick. She's not pregnant, is she? Hunter stifled a groan. No, Mom. She's not pregnant. I love her, and I want to marry her. Okay. What do you want for a wedding gift? She sounded disappointed, but she wouldn't argue with him about it. His family never argued. They didn't have enough emotion inside them to argue or tease like Becca's family did. Half the reason he wanted to marry her was for her family. Well, not half. A small part of it, though. He wanted to have a loving boisterous family who teased him and called him Puddin' Pop. Why not? I don't need a gift, Mom. I just thought you'd want to know. When will you be back in Denver? She asked. I'd like to meet her. We'll be there next week. I'll be moving to Silver Springs. Her business is here. And my heart is here. I need to be able to write well, and this seems to be the place for me to do it. Have a good wedding. Maybe you could come by while you're in town. I'd like that. Bye, Mom. I love you. There was silence from the phone for a moment. I love you too. He didn't remember ever hearing his mother say that, but he didn't remember ever saying it to her either. What did that say about his family? As Hunter put the phone down, he jumped at a knock on his door. Who would be bugging him right before the wedding? He opened the door to see Spike and his future father-in-law, Bob Roberts. He couldn't look at him without thinking his full name. He loved it. I'm here to escort you to the gazebo for the wedding, Spike said. I want to make sure you're not a flight risk. Why would I be a flight risk? Have you seen your sister? She's beautiful and about to be all mine. Spike stuck his fingers in his ears. La 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 la, I can't hear you. Bob laughed, putting his arm around Hunter's shoulders. Just make sure to give my wife grandbaby soon, son. We need dozens of them. Hunter grinned. I love the idea of kids. We'll start trying right away for you. You're going to be my favorite son-in-law. Have I told you that yet? No, but I'm sure you'll say that to two other men as well. Maybe not this week, but you'll say it. You're already figuring me out. How could you not be my favorite? Hunter walked over to stand beside Jack. 
I hope you don't mind me horning in on your wedding. Aaron is happy, so I'm happy. It's that simple. I hope I can make Becca happy, Hunter said softly. He knew his parents barely tolerated one another. There was no love lost between them. Would he and Becca take after her family, who had love to spare? Or his, who couldn't find love if it whacked them over the head with a baseball bat? All of his thoughts left his head as the music started playing. First Bree and Emma walked slowly down the aisle. And then Aaron. His heart was beating so fast, he couldn't wait to catch a glimpse of his bride. Aaron looked pretty, and he heard Jack gasp behind him. Her hand was put in Jack's, and a few seconds passed before Bob walked down the aisle with Becca on his arm. Becca looked, incredible. Her eyes were locked on him, and she had a smile on her face. She carried roses, instead of the daisies that Aaron carried. Did she prefer roses? How could he not know what his soon-to-be wife's favorite flower was? Becca stopped beside him, and her dad put her hand in his. He smiled down at her, gripping her fingers tight. Leaning down he whispered, What's your favorite flower? She smiled. Roses. Why? He shrugged. Just feels like something your husband should know. The wedding was fast. Pastor Johnson had known Jack and Becca since they were small children. When Hunter was told he could kiss his bride, he caught her and dipped her over his arm, kissing her madly. Becca clung to his shoulders, surprised that he would do something so boisterous. He was usually such a quiet man. Maybe her family was already rubbing off on him. As they mingled during the reception, Becca spotted Zach, Spike's business partner, and he had a girl with him, which was pretty unusual. She walked over to talk to him and was startled. For a moment, the girl looked so much like her sister Mike that she actually thought it was her. Becca smiled at Zach. I wanted to make sure you heard about Mike. He looked at her. Heard what? She's coming home in a couple of weeks. For good. Zach's whole face lit up. Really? That's what I hear. Mom can give you any details you need. Becca patted his hand, knowing how he felt about Mike. How could anyone not know? She walked back to Hunter, finding him surrounded by members of the Roberts clan. Her cousin Sam was talking to him, Lena clinging to his arm, wearing a beautiful designer dress. The clothes that woman wore made Becca feel shabby in her wedding dress. They would be the next to marry, their wedding scheduled for the next month. She didn't know Lena well enough to try to commandeer her wedding, though. Hours later, Becca and Hunter were finally alone and in his car heading toward Denver. She'd changed into shorts and a t-shirt, happy to be out of her wedding dress. It was nice to feel glamorous for a few hours, but so much nicer to feel like her again. My mom wants to meet you, he said, his eyes on the road. Oh, that'd be nice. Will we see her while we're in Denver? You've mentioned a brother, but I don't think you've mentioned your parents. It was odd for her that he wouldn't mention them, because her family was such a huge part of her life. Yeah, I told her we'd try to see her this week. I hope you don't mind taking some time from our honeymoon to meet your mother-in-law. He took a deep breath, wondering if he should tell her about his family. But what could he say? I don't mind. I'm excited to meet her, and I hope we'll be close. She rested her head against the back of her bucket seat, staring over at Hunter. What's she like? My family is the anti-Roberts family. When I called my mom, she assumed something was wrong, because it wasn't her birthday or Mother's Day. That's sad. What's wrong with you? You should call your mother more often. He smiled. Well, it's not just that. I realized, while I was talking to her today, that I've never heard her say, I love you. I know that's weird, but... My family is very distant. We kind of tolerate each other, but we don't enjoy each other. Not like your family does. She rolled her eyes. 
No one should be like my family. I disagree. Your family is nuts and loud, but there's joy when they're together. It's obvious everyone cares about everyone else. There's none of that with us. I didn't even think about calling mom and telling her I was getting married until today. You'd think I'd have called her right away, but I wasn't even sure she'd care. She reached out and stroked his arm softly. We're not raising our kids like that. They're going to know they're loved. Always. He nodded emphatically. I agree, but you may have to teach me. I don't know how to be a good father. I've never had it modeled. Was your dad abusive? Oh, not at all. I don't think he cared enough to be abusive. My family never argues, they never tease, there's no emotion in anything. I hate it so much. She sighed. We're not going to be that way. Do you know why? He took his eyes off the road for a second to look at her. No, why? Because I love you with everything inside me. Sometimes it hurts I love you so much. He slowed down and pulled off to the side of the road. Don't say it if you don't mean it. She smiled. I think I knew I was meant to love you the first instant I saw you. He unbuckled her seat belt and pulled her as close as he could across the bucket seats. I love you too, Becca. I don't think I quite knew how to tell you. I got you a ring, and I dropped it on your lap, because I figured I could avoid saying it that way. Well, I'm glad you didn't avoid saying it forever. I was starting to worry that you would. She stroked his cheek and pulled his head down for a kiss. I'm going to tell you I love you every day. And our children will hear it constantly. Your dad told me to start making babies right away because your mom was ready to be a grandmother. And Spike stuck his fingers in his ears and started singing to drown him out. She laughed. Spike's a brat. He just can't think about his baby sister being married and doing married people things. Like her husband? Becca's laughter filled the car. Exactly like that. Silly Spike. I love you, Becca Sloan. And I love you even more, Hunter Sloan. Hunter shook his head. Nope, you don't. How do you know that? Because you've always loved people. I've spent all my life saving all my love up for you. She rested her head against him. But I'm more practiced at love. Lucky me, 